Good morning. It's fabulous to be back in Des Moines. I used to uh, live in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I started my career. You know, it's interesting. Everyone's been talking about you know years and 1974 and the 80s and and that. Um, 1974, I was born. So we'll just get all this age thing out of the way as to not discriminate. Um, I was born in 1974. Uh, I think I started driving grain truck maybe when I was 11 or 12. I then discovered combines had air conditioning and I said, I'm going to learn how to drive combine. I was very fortunate that I had a great dad that said, absolutely can do and be whatever you want. I don't, he actually doesn't listen to me anymore, so <laughs> I'm not sure how much he really believed that. But uh, my first combine I drove was uh, a 7722 uh, Titan II um, when I was about 14. So I uh, grew up in a town, about uh, 700 people. Actually, we didn't live in the town. We uh, have a farm. My best friends were my siblings. Graduated with 12 kids, six boys, six girls. Went to Washington State. So uh, go Cougs and go Land Grant Universities. Um, so I was totally thrilled when I was hearing all the jokes about Iowa State last night. Uh, big, big believer uh, in, the, in the land grant programs. Um, I actually was a chemical engineer major. Uh, and then I discovered, and this is the great irony because I do trade futures and options and, and uh, structured derivatives um, for National Australia Bank and Macquarie. Uh, but I could not pass calculus. I took it three times, and I said, maybe chemical engineering is not my future. So I switched to agricultural business. And uh, I like to uh, tease the kids that I lecture to at Columbia and NYU that are spending all this money that the person that they're having to listen to the, to the next year couldn't pass calculus, became a senior vice president, and probably, uh, yeah, I was on an athletic scholarship, and my college education cost them what uh, a semester at, at their uh, university does. So. I'm not sure who got the best deal. Um, graduating from college in 96, agriculture wasn't uh, the, the sexiest thing. So it was kind of the dot-com um, time frame. Everybody was getting into that. Uh, I joined Cargill. I like to call it the reach out and adopt a land-grant university uh, kid. Uh, I started with Cargill. I li lived in Norfolk, Virginia, Minneapolis, and Des Moines. Uh, as a trader for the grain division, wet milling division, oil seed processing division. Went to DC for five years, happened to be in a conference in Hong Kong, I could spell corn, and suddenly I was worthy of becoming an investment banker. Uh, that was in 05. Uh, went to New York for a year with National Australia Bank, moved to Sydney, Australia for a year, came back with Macquarie, flew around the world for a year and a half, and then I said, by God, I'd really like my life back. Uh, and I started uh, Conciliagra in January of 2009. We are an introducing broker, most of my clients. Uh, again, my dad doesn't listen to me, so I don't have very many farm clients. Um, but uh, I've got some ethanol plants, flour mills in Vietnam, Malaysia, Nigeria, as well as investment banks and hedge funds. I specialize completely in grains and oil seeds. That's what I'll be talking to you about today, specifically the soy complex and how I see it and what I see coming up. Uh, the pipeline, um, and that's kind of my background. I also trade my own money, sometimes well, sometimes not so well, uh, as we all do. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's always quite humble. Um, so with that, let me uh, jump into it. Again, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. I'll try to make it an entertaining and, and maybe interesting next hour. Uh, Carrie, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, and again, it's great to be back in Des Moines. It's, uh, it's been quite a while, so... So what if, this is kind of the scenario and the questions I'm going to be asking over the course of as we look to what the markets look like in the next five years, next 10 years, next 15 years. You know, quite honestly, I think soy beans and the soy complex and really the world veg oil is probably the most interesting and dynamic part of world agriculture. Uh, it's certainly the sexiest when you want to talk about dietary consumption and the global and emerging markets and, and that sort of thing. There always seems to, to be moving points. But let's kind of talk about kind of the, the bigger picture. What if? There's, this number is thrown out a lot. By 2050, 9 billion people. Okay, that's nice. 
but right now it's 2014 and you know hopefully by by 2015 I'll you know be you know I've lost my mind completely from trading and sitting on a beach drinking a vodka soda but um, that's fine so 2050 we're gonna have 9 billion people but what's so fascinating right now is I think we're in a period of time where there's never been such pressure and such opposing pressures on the world food system. I don't think it's about being able to produce massive amounts. I think it's about being able to deliver to the consumer what she or he wants. And as disposable incomes rise, there seems to be a greater uh, purchasing power and want of this Western lifestyle or want of uh, different options. And so right now what I find fascinating is that we're in a period, yes, we're gonna have nine billion people by 2050, but right now, right here now, you've got over a billion people that are faced with obesity that's going to have huge financial reper you know, repercussions on the, on the health system, um, et cetera. And you still have just under a billion people that live in extreme poverty. Those are, that's, that's a huge divergence. And, and those, those, those opposing and, and such the spread there is what's driving the food system. These are the, the longer term trends when you kind of talk about what's coming up the pipeline. I think the bottom line here, you can all read me, I went to, like I said, Washington State, so sometimes that's questionable. But uh, emerging markets and large populations are at the forefront center of what's going on. That's been the focus, these large populations. Let's produce a lot, let's produce more, we need more. But what if, what if it's not about population? What if it's about income? And I'm building into a scenario because I'm not sure it's about soybeans anymore. I think it's about income and it's about income growth and it's about emerging markets. These are my agricultural trends that I usually look at. Again, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. I'm a bit ADD, so I apologize if I jump around uh, in my, uh, my presentation. Like I said, there's so many complex parts of this market now that I really try to dummy it down into these five trends. And everything feeds back into these five building blocks. Again, we're gonna go through these but these are the five principles. But what if, again, I'm kind of alluded to this, that it maybe isn't so much about soybeans anymore. The world's proven. They, they can produce soybeans for the world. China has not been the price maker, it has been the price taker. Its demand is so massive and the world has responded to that. But what happens now if it's about soy meal? You know, congratulations, because what soybeans have done and what soybean producers have done and crushers, et cetera, is made the world completely and totally reliant on soybeans. It's 80% meal. It's 80% protein. There is no substitute for meal. Not in quality not in protein levels, et cetera. And I think first and foremost, it has been meal and will continue to be meal that will not allow soybean prices to break. You know, we were very fortunate. Um, like I said, I spoke in, in Vietnam and, and Carrie was there and, and maybe a few others. But I kept going, you know, I was like, I'm not sure, I can't be that bearish. You know, people talked about $9, $8.50, $8 type beans. And I said, you know, I think we're missing out that it's meal. And it will continue to be soybean meal. Because the issue is crush capacity. The issue is crush margins. It's not the world's ability to produce soybeans. And we're going to get into this further of why soy meal is so important. And I think why over the next five years, 10 years, decades, that it's going to be meal that will drive, it's going to be the engine and even the more prolific engine for this complex.
this is uh, getting back to the conciliagra trends. So let's start building these building blocks into this thesis of, of why do I see the world as I see it. So we've been slowly rebuilding, whether it's wheat, whether it's corn, whether it's soybeans. These are the daily consumption rates. Again, it's been soybeans and meal and oil that have been the demand drivers, really when you look across corn, wheat. Wheat is, is quite boring, in fact, you know, <laughs> if it wasn't for Putin and Russia, you know, wheat is, it would not be a story. Um, corn, the driver there, yes, world feed demand is growing, but it's been ethanol. And those previous slides that we saw with Al's presentation highlights that, that essentially, you know, ethanol really wasn't on the grid until 2005. And now when you look at it, again, dummy it down, it's plateaued, it's flat, um, it's pretty neutral. I don't think the U.S. can rely on ethanol exports to continue to build ethanol demand. And, and therefore, I think, it's, it, again, it's plateaued. And really, the growth engine will continue to be from these numbers that we see whether it's soybeans, whether it's canola, whether it's sunflower, whether it's palm, etc. This is the veg oil consumption. Yeah, again, who does anybody know the world's largest veg oil um, that's traded? Anybody? It's palm oil. Soybean oil actually isn't isn't that glamorous when you talk about a global veg oil landscape. And again, this is why you, know, you come back to it and everyone's like, well, you know, the growth is Southeast Asia when you want to talk about protein demand. Sure. But Malaysia and Indonesia, which where those growth engines are, as well as Vietnam, as well as Thailand, they sit in an area that produces 80 to 90 percent of the world's palm oil. Palm oil trades right now at nearly $180 a metric ton discount to bean oil. Okay, that's why you don't see the investments in crush plants and while that region is quite beholden to meal imports. Okay, so you know, it's understanding those relationships. I got into palm oil about five years ago and it's, it's quite fascinating and I think it actually has helped me become a much better trader and a much better analyst is to understand those cross flows and influences in that region, which again is the growth region for the dietary shift. So palm oil remained very, very important. World supply cushion. Again, what's been amazing to me, and, and soybeans by and of their own nature tend to be bullish. They're bullish leaning. It's, it's not a bearish type crop, it's more bullish. Again, you've got biofuels that feed into that, the dietary that, you know, that feeds into it, the China story, etc. But what's so fascinating is that you look at the price performance across grains and oil seeds, and you've got a supply cushion, and I, I use, I don't look at ending stocks or stocks to use ratio because I think the world is so just in time inventory and you know, those numbers are nice to relate to, but really what does it mean? So I try to look in things in terms of supply cushion. And a supply cushion is to take global consumption, divide it by 365 days, that gives you a daily consumption rate. You take that number, divide it into ending stocks, and that's the number you would get if the world were never to produce another soybean come August 31st, the end of the marketing year. So if the world didn't produce any more soybeans, the U.S. didn't plant a crop this fall, South America harvests theirs, we would still have 115 days of soybeans. That is much bigger than wheat, and I hate wheat, and I'm exceptionally bearish wheat, and I don't like it, and, and it's been painful uh, these last couple of weeks, but that's fine. Um, it is what it is. But even soybeans are larger. It has a larger supply cushion than wheat. That's pretty astounding that, and again, because I think it goes back to meal, and it's soy meal that is so vital, not only to crush margins, especially in the U.S. U.S. crushers are printing money, over $2 a bushel, 
When I was with Cargill, we were lucky to cover variable cost. That was exciting. And that was really through 96 to, to 2000. Okay. So again, when you talk about a supply cushion, soybeans actually are the most bearish on paper, but it's bucking the trend. What's even more fascinating, and we'll talk about Argentina in a couple other slides, but the, the bean market, as you know, has been an inverse, right? That means the front is higher than the back, which is saying the market wants these soybeans now, not later, right? Are we all in agreement? This has been the structure of the market. What is fascinating to me, and this is, you know, never underestimate how, you know, frankly put, you know, pissed off a farmer can be, but go to Argentina. I, I, when I started Conciliagra, I split time. I moved back to D.C., and I was splitting time. I lived in Buenos Aires um, for three years, um, about half the year. Buenos Aires and Argentina in 2010 is much different than it is today. But what is astounding to me is that an Argentine farmer could ignore a dollar, a dollar fifty inverse in the market. That means if they sold it today, they would get paid a dollar, dollar fifty more, two dollars, depending on what premiums were doing more. But in 13, 14, which is just last year, they were holding 44% of the world's soybeans. Okay, why does Argentina matter? Argentina is the world's largest meal and bean oil exporter. And so if you're a producer of soybeans, you should be writing a thank you note, just as wheat farmers should be writing a thank you note to Russia, you should be writing a thank you note to the Argentine farmer or even La Presidenta Kirchner, who is just bat cuckoo crazy, truly. I uh, sat in a meeting with her and uh, it was one of those times where, I mean, I've met some crazy people. I'm a trader, so I probably, you know, borderline crazy. But I was like, wow, <laughs> there's like something clearly off here. It was astounding. I was like, whoa, glad I don't look like that in the mirror. Um, I'm okay for now. <laughs> this is a, a, a visual, and like I said, I'll get back to Argentina. It's my... Uh, ADD kicking in and jumping around, so I apologize. But we will get back to Argentina because I find it fascinating what this has done to the world meal market. And again, as a producer, you got to love meal and you got to love Argentina. Let's look at veg oil. And I apologize. It's, um, it's, I should know my slides and have memorized them because I speak quite a bit around the world. But uh, every once in a while, it's nice to look at them. Um, but this is uh, the veg oil supply cushion. Yeah, again, you know, the, the thing why I don't think bean oil is that sexy when you compare it to meal is that with bean oil, you've got palm oil, you've got canola oil or rapeseed oil, so that's Europe and Canada and Australia. You've got sunflower oil, which is the emerging markets of Russia and, and Ukraine and the Black Sea. And look what the Black Sea has done to the world wheat market. It globalized it starting in 0203. What has the Ukraine done to the world corn market? It's now become a dominant low cost corn exporter. Same influence, you know, sunflower um, as well. So the Black Sea really continues to be a pivot point. But again, the, the bottom line there is with veg oil, you just have too many origins competing for a finite demand and whether it's biofuel driven or food dietary driven, and really, when you look at veg oil, that's been the, the first shoe, per se, if you will. The first shoe that, that dropped and really reflects global, that, that dietary shift. I'm going to ask this question now because I'm going to get into, and, and you'll now understand a little bit later why I'm asking the question. But does anybody know the world's largest veg oil importer? Who that is? Okay, it's India. Remember that. Because I'm going to get back to that. It is India. Palm oil, soybean oil, etc. So remember India, world's largest veg oil importer. 
Not much on the world trade grid when it comes to protein. It has been the lowest soy meal exporter price uh, into Southeast Asia, but that is changing. And again, feeds into this love affair, clearly, that I'm having with soybean meal. Again, competition for demand. This started in 0203, really, with the Black Sea, what we called the Black Sea invasion in wheat, which was the return or the emergence of the Black Sea as low-cost origin for the world wheat market. Again, we've seen what they've done or what Ukraine is doing to the world corn market, followed by Brazil and the safrina plantings, which is the corn crop they plant after soybean production. And really, it's been the safrina corn crop that is what Brazil exports, just for what it's worth. It's not their full season corn. It's their double cropped corn, which allowed Brazil, plus the small crop in the US two years ago, to become the world's largest corn exporter. Who would have ever thought those words would have been spoken? So competition for demand, it's not just isolated. Let's look at Brazil. What I think about is interesting about Brazil is not so much that it can't produce soybeans. It will become the world's largest soybean producer. And that's, it is what it is. You know, soybeans, unlike corn, soybeans actually have to have more acreage. I think the yield potential could slowly rise. But when you look across the sphere, there's not the disparity between world soybean yields as it is in corn yields, okay? So Brazil, Argentina, the US, very similar yields. When you look at corn yields, it's exceptionally, <laughs> you know, the US is here and everybody else is, is here. You know, uh, Brazil's average corn crop yield is 80, 85 bushels an acre. So with corn, you really don't need that much more land. You need more technology, greater inputs. Soybean needs land. Who has land? Brazil. But the fascinating thing about Brazil is I can't remember. I think Cargill, when they built their crush plant, that was put on hold for a couple years as well as an export facility, so that would have been oh, the years blur, especially the more conferences and drinks you have. But I want to say 2003 or four was maybe the last time you had a crush plant built in Brazil. And yet, they are growing larger and larger bean crops that are being exported. So Brazil's not the pan panacea or the solution for the world meal importer. Because the more beans that Brazil produces, the more they export. And so if you have a crop that's over 68 million tons, which obviously this year, you know, what is it going to be, 92, 94? Who, you know, it's all relative. But it doesn't increase their crushing. It increases the amount of exportable surplus Brazil has. So remember that when you look at Brazil. Okay, it is not the solution for the world meal market. This is just a, a reflection of that. And as you see the trend in the right slide, the line, you know, it's lower left, upper right. That reflects the last two minutes of my blah, blah, blah. This is just Mato Grosso by itself. Okay, you also have the, the northern part of Brazil where land is being put into production in the, they call it the Mapito region, which really right there has been driven more by POE um, than anything else. That's also where the new ports are going to be brought in, which, you know, which is great for a world soybean importer because it will reduce the cost of transportation out of Brazil. But really it's Mato Grosso that holds land. And again, this is just to reaffirm the point that I was making, that Brazil has plenty of land that can still be brought into production. All right, end scene. Argentina. Argentina, this is a slide. 
Okay, we know that they're the largest meal and bean oil exporter, but on this, what I find really interesting is how much they crush. So Argentina, again, try to keep it simple. Argentina's crush capacity is 55 million tons, more or less. The biggest crop, I think, Argentina doesn't have any more land. They might take some pasture land and, and plant some soybeans, but by and large, you're capped. So Argentina doesn't have any more land. They have crazy presidents and a socialist system, and you know that's what they have. But you know, when 2001, the financial collapse, the first crisis, and they're on the verge of another one, but uh, in 2001, they reintroduced export taxes. They said they would never do that. They did. Then they introduced differential export taxes, which basically gave a 3.5% spread or tariff, and that's how you expanded the soybean crush capacity in Argentina. Okay, so 55 million tons, but yet what happened is La Presidenta said, I need money to pay for my socialist ways, and, you know, the, the rest is history. And the producers said, no, we will not. Um, we'll see what happens with the banking restrictions, um, but by and large, you know, most of my guys are, you know, their money's offshore, and... There, you know, it's a it's a barter system, et cetera. So I don't think that's that's going to do much. But when you look at this, you know, it's not like Argentina's exporting beans. You know, they export very little. They're using it at their crush facilities. And so why you care about Argentina is because you're only using a finite capacity. Crush margins stink. Okay, you're printing money in the U.S. China crush margins are under pressure. And Argentina, because of what they're having to pay for fuel, for energy, the inflation running at 25%, it's not a, it, it, that's not your solution either. And look at uh, bean oil premiums out of South America. You've gone from minus 200 to 250 six months ago to 300, 350 over. Yeah, you want to talk about a basis swing? That is massive. Okay. And because of that, you know, Argentina is using more of their bean oil for biodiesel. Again, another differential export tax between bean oil and biodiesel. Even if Europe has said, you know what, we're not gonna take your biodiesel, da da da, it continues to grow, you have expanded mandates in Argentina. Oh, and then you've got Brazil. They just increased their biofuel mandates to 7%. And the world needs Brazilian meal. The world needs Argentine meal. And Argentine meal protein sucks, sorry. Point blank, bottom line, is awful. And I think part of that is because they have planted soybeans on top of soybeans, on top of soybeans, on top of soybeans. You want to talk about a monoculture of a train wreck? You know, th those are issues in Argentina. And this is who the world is relying on to solve the meal situation? Sorry, I get super excited. Because um, I think it's fascinating, right? Maybe you got, I, I hope you find it fascinating. But it, it, it's just, you know, this, you, you're, you're, you're focused on, on this country. And it doesn't give enough credit to just how screwed up again. Again, it's going to hold 39% this year. 44% last year, 39% this year of the world soybean stocks. White silo bags. Brazil's starting to adopt white silo bags. Do not underestimate a well-financed and well-capitalized farm sector. Because they will say, no gracias, no obrigada, and I will just hold it. You know, no necesita dinero, I don't need money, no problema. I'll just go drink caparinas and dance and it'll be great. This is a quick look at Meal. Again, I'm hammering on meal because I think this is your knight in shining armor for world bean prices. You got to be best friends with meal. Obviously, Argentina, the blue line, it peaked, it's declined. Brazil, steady decline. As world meal trade expands, Brazil's on the decline, right? Because there's been no more investment in crush capacity there. 
They're starting to actually use more meal domestically, right? Brazil's gonna be Russia's savior when it comes to you know, their protein you know, and their meat needs. But you've got an expanding animal sector in Brazil. The US meal, so we had record meal sales out of the US this year. Super exciting. And it's why meal went from $298 to $400 in the course of maybe 10 trading days. It was astounding, the whip. Because everybody forgets meal, you can't store it. It doesn't have a shelf life. That's why it's going to be really hard, I think, to break the inverse. Okay? You also, the U.S. has never been, I mean, that, the, the export facilities, there's only so many that can handle meal. Okay? It's, I was in Norfolk, and it just, it smells, it's chalky, gritty, it flies everywhere. It's not corn or soybeans or wheat, which is, you know, it's much easier to handle. You know, and, and, and you have protein, and it goes off great a lot easier, et cetera, et cetera. But what's interesting is you've actually seen the U.S. meal exports expand. And why is that? Because following the financial crisis, we decimated our poultry, our pork, you know, the swine herd, the poultry numbers. And quite frankly, you know, as, as goes everything, globalization and that, you know, more countries are able to produce meat less expensively. You know, they don't have the environmental restrictions, the, you know, animal rights group, et cetera. Um, although I think that's going to be a growing momentum around the world. So it'll be interesting. Okay, this is just another reflection. Again, I didn't put meal up here because meal, yeah, if, if you ever look at the, the WASD, the USDA WASD, you know, ending stocks are always 275, 300. 300, 295. Yeah, it, again, because meal's you know, short, short life and, and you usually find an end market for it. But what I find interesting is, again, even, even though you're having record soybean production, bean oil, world bean oil ending stocks, because of biofuels, not so much the dietary shift right now, but biofuels led by Argentina and Brazil, because the U.S. is pretty stagnant, 4.8 billion pounds last year, retroactive you know, biodiesel credit, 2015, probably the same thing, 4.8 billion pounds, yeah, but we're using more canola oil. Thank you, Canada. You had a large crop. We'll take that. You know, and again, the palm oil spread between palm oil and, and bean oil is very, very wide. And palm oil has one job only right now, and that's to buy demand. Period. To buy demand. Because you have ending stocks in Malaysia that are you know, the highest since early to 2013. So again, you have some very wide disparities going on. Record ending soy stocks quite stable bean oil ending stocks. You would not think that be the case. And again, I think you've got a lot of quiet confluences going under this bean market that make it really interesting. Kind of talk briefly on the Black Sea. You know, um, until recently, until, you know, Russia, wait, the ruble's down 50%. You know, why fire a shot when you can just put in sanctions and really give it to someone? Um, and that's what's happened with Russia. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, ruble has had a bit of a bounce, but it's down significantly. You've seen, as a reflection of that, sunflower oil actually go back to its traditional, its traditional role, which was always to trade as a premium oil to bean oil. But prior to this, wheat rally, etc. prior to this, actually sunflower oil was trading at a discount to soybean oil. That's kind of interesting to me. It, it reinforces this buyer's market, which is one of my trends, right? A buyer's market is more stable to, to bearish characteristics. Wheat market is a buyer's market. It's not about flat price. It's just that you have many origins competing for the demand pie that's there. Just like world veg oil, you have many veg oils competing for the demand that's there. And, you know, Malaysia and Indonesia keep talking about, you know, we're going to produce biodiesel out of palm oil. They have biodiesel plants. It, it, it just, they can't get it together. And part of that is Malaysia subsidizes uh, their energy costs quite highly. Um, so those go run counter uh, to that. Um, but it's quite interesting that, you know, on the palm oil side, the world's largest palm oil producers 
can't get, it, it's just not happening there, which is not bullish for demand. Uh, the, the global demand engines, again, they're idling. They're not out of gas, but they're idling. They're taking a breath. That's more on the corn side of things, I think, on an ethanol, because I think finally biofuels is having its day in the sun, which is really interesting. But it's also, it's all led outside the U.S. What's going on is more outside the U.S. when you talk about world veg oil and world veg oil growth. Again, Europe using palm oil for fuel. Uh, the European um, set-aside program that uses canola oil for fuel. And then a, the expanding Brazilian and Argentine mandates, which I think are fascinating, especially when Brazil comes online. Because I think they're going to be crushing beans for oil and not meal, which prolongs this meal situation, or it adds potential fuel to the world meal situation. The world dietary shift, it continues. Um, I probably fly, fly about, well, when I, when I worked for Macquarie, I probably flew close to 200,000 miles a year. I would arrive in Paris, get a phone call, we need you in Stockholm. Oh, you now need to go to Abu Dhabi. Hey, go home, get new suits. Uh, we need you in Sydney, Singapore, China, et cetera. Now I probably fly about 100, 120,000 miles a year, uh, which is quite nice. Um, most of that time is spent, I have quite a few clients in Southeast Asia. India is an expanding market. I still get down to South America, mis amigos. Um, plus South America is lovely. Uh, and that, um, but you do see that, you know, the world is slowing a bit. It is slowing a bit. But what no one thought would happen has happened, and that's crude oil broke. And right now we're probably seeing the greatest wealth transfer that we've seen since the, you know, financial crisis, really, and the collapse. You know, there were winners and losers. But the amount of money that is bleeding out of OPEC or the, the shale fields and, and that sort of thing and being transferred to the consumer and putting money in the consumer's pocket is astounding. In fact, you know, there's been numbers that the global economy will actually grow an extra half a percent to 1% because of crude oil below $60. So what we thought maybe was slowing in stagnation I think has really got a resurge in some areas, in some areas, than we previously thought. I'll report back. I head back over to Southeast Asia in March, so I'll let you let you know what's going over there. But uh, you know, they've been by and large very immune. Indonesia is an incredible story, um, et cetera. So, but this is just a, a quick photo there. If you haven't seen this, this always reminds me of the power of China. You know, when, when you start looking at these numbers, you read left to right, you know, but by 20, you know, 2025, I mean, this is, and you compare it to Europe, and you talk about the infrastructure that's going on, I, that's just, that's massive. You know, what was the last country that industrialized? Which is what China's doing, right? What was the last country? The U.S. The U.S. didn't have 1.3 billion people didn't have mobile phones, didn't have the website, you know, didn't have the World Wide Web. The world wasn't as interconnected, and yet here you have this going on under these, under these conditions. I, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, and I think, you know, like I said, I, I can't wait to, to look back uh, 25 years from now, if I can remember, um, and, and what it all looks like now. Again, this is just a look, um, you know, I had mentioned India, China. The table on the left is the palm oil. Okay, quite flat. You know, palm oil's done a great job in maximizing demand in both China and India. Actually, visual import margins in China are, are quite negative. That's driven by policy, not driven by market conditions. And in fact, it'll be fascinating to see what China's government does with their three, four million tons of canola reserves, canola oil reserves, right, that they've been building. Um, they're probably worth 25% of what they were when they were stockpiling during the peak. What do you do with that? Um, 
you know, the, to China real quick and corn. I, I think it would be a mistake um, presently, unless there's a crop failure. Corn has been designated as a special commodity for the Chinese government. Um, I don't think they have any intention of replicating their impact on world corn trade as they have soybean trade, just for what it's worth. Um, I think they do have to deal with uh, some poor quality corn um, that's going moldy, but I'm not one of those people that see China as this, this massive uh, net importer of corn um, because of, of government programs um, that are pointed to corn and domestic production there um, and set aside. Uh, and, and, you know, what, what, what they're putting in place very quietly um, right now. So I, I think ultimately, but it's not something that I see in, in even the next five years, whereas they will be a constant presence in the soybean market, in the canola market, um, and an expanding presence in the world soy meal export market. So who's the next China? China's been the, the great price taker. The world has responded. China does not, I do not believe, China does not make world, world bean prices. Their, their demand is so massive, their crush capacity is so overbuilt, you know, it has gone through consolidation and it will continue to go through consolidation but I do not see in the near term that they will be anywhere close to operating at even 50% of their capacity in the next four or five years. Okay, again, they're, they're kind of sorting through a lot of things and consolidation is one of them. But when you're faced with record ending stocks and the world has responded so quickly, you've got to ask yourself, well, if it's not gonna be China, who is it going to be? So drum roll. I hope I got the slides right. What you've been waiting for. I think India to the world meal market will be what China is to the world bean market. Now there's some interesting stats right there and you can read through them. I would but A, I wear glasses and B, I'm blind and yeah. I don't want to get a sore neck. Um, plus, it gives you something to do while I'm chit-chatting away. But what's interesting to me is, you know, you look at India. India's got a few issues. Yeah, I remember uh, I was a punk little, gosh, when was this? Well, I've always been a punk. But I guess in, in um, 02, 02, 03, went over to Singapore, and uh, Kwok Oil was a client, Mr. Kwok. So Quack Oil it owns Wilmar, and Wilmar is the world's largest veg oil uh, importer user uh, and a massive Chinese crusher, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sitting in a meeting with Mr. Quack, and you know, we're chatting, and he said, you know, why, why do you think Wilmar is investing so heavily in China but not India? I was like, oh, well, Mr. Quack, let me, let me show you my statistics. Ticka, 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 and I was like, and you got this, and he's like, while impressive, he goes, no, it's very simple. China is a communist country and we can get things done. India is a democracy that has an election every day. Think about that. It's pretty interesting. Especially when you see what that company has done. But India, uh, you know, everyone's super excited. I was in uh, Goa. Uh, which is a lovely beach uh, city, about an hour and a half outside of Mumbai, I hear, because I got to go during monsoon season. I was so excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to get to go to Goa for the first time. And, you know, one of my, I've got lots of big brothers. Uh, I've been so fortunate to meet so many amazing people. And, and AJ is one of them, and he's British Indian. I said, hey, AJ, you know, I'm going to go to Goa. I'm super excited. You know, are you going to come to this conference? Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, we can hang out at your dad's, like, palatial mansion, that would be awesome. He goes, you know it's monsoon season, right? He goes, no one goes to Goa in June. I was like, oh, right. But I did, I went, it was very turbulent uh, flying in. It was amazing, 
Um, but what was fascinating there is people were super excited because Modi's been elected and, you know, it, it's kind of the first time that their version of parliament or Congress, you know, everyone's on the same page, the same team. Um, growth uh, is at 5%. Uh, the rupee was trying to recover. A lot of enthusiasm. Um, and, it's, and it's slowly coming to fruition. You still have a billion people in democracy and election every day, but, you know, hey, baby steps, right? But look at this. I, I don't, maybe, maybe you guys knew this, I don't know, but eggs are the cheapest and largest source of protein for India. A lot of people say, well, you know, uh, uh, India's Hindu. They're not going to eat pork. I'm like, well, we didn't know your religion. <laughs> Good job. Uh, you know, or beef, or, you know, they can't be China. But they, but they can in terms of poultry, in terms of aquaculture. India is the, the number two producer of shrimp, right behind China. You know, where, where are you putting your checkoff dollars? Yeah, there seems to be a lot of that, you know, focus on aquaculture. Let's feed the fishy some meal. Cool, okay, that works for me. You know, all's fair in love and war. Fish meal doesn't get it all. So you've got aquaculture. What really stands out to me and blows my mind away and makes me super, super, I'm like, okay, cool, I want to own the back end of this inverse all day long and meal, is look at poultry. Just those numbers... But it's not so much the sheer magnitude of, you know, the 54 million per, per, per week. It's that that only equates to two and a half kilograms per person. And Bangladesh, which is no Monaco compared to India, consumes eight to nine. And that's a neighboring state. And you start looking and you're like, okay, well, if, if there you start trending like their neighbors, again, a little bit slower, but they've got that sheer population. I, I think India is absolutely fascinating. India has proven it cannot produce an oil seed, whether that's cottonseed, groundnut, whatever that might be, just kidding, uh, soybeans, et cetera, because it deals with the monsoon cycle, right? In case you didn't know that, India, agriculture, monsoon season, that's what that whole big country of a billion people are, uh, are, are doing. And what's interesting to me is that SOPA, which is the equivalent of NOPA, because as they say in India, we don't do anything original, we just replicate and copy. So SOPA is the equivalent of the US NOPA, which is the oil seed crushers. And they're actually part of and lobbying with the feed industry to allow meal imports free of tariff, which, as a crush, you would think would be detrimental. But they're saying, no, yeah, we, we, we need it. We, we, we need it. Uh, GMO biotechnology, a huge issue. But why, when you look back on Vegua, you're like, wait a minute. India is the largest bean oil importer. Last time I checked, that bean being crushed is the same bean that's producing 80% meal and 20% bean oil. And so they think they'll be able to kind of go the meal route rather than import raw soybeans to feed their crush plants to be able to, to do meal. And I do believe that once or if that is approved and the momentum takes off and you can bring domestic meal values down in India, the dietary shift takes off, just as you've seen in veg oil. Because it's very easy, or it's been much easier to put veg oil into the diets. It's this, this is the next shoe. In case you guys didn't know, Europe is the largest meal importer. It's slowly been on the decline as its feed contracted, right? So really, during the financial crisis, the only place that you saw protein demand contract was the US and Europe. Didn't slow down in China didn't slow down in Southeast Asia, didn't slow down in Turkey, didn't slow down in the Middle East. It only was rationed in developed old countries per se. Japan would probably be a part of that as well. So I think that's kind of interesting. Is the inelasticity, look at that summary. 
I win. Um, is, is the inelasticity of, of the meal demand. And, and to that point, you know, in the past decade, meal demand's been up 43%. <clears throat> Last year, when meal prices were about $500, more or less, and you had a massive inverse, you had 4.5% growth. Meal now is at 363, 365. But again, just because you have a record bean crop does not mean and does not equate to record meal production. Again, crappy crush margins in China. It's recovering. Meal prices are trying to recover. But crush margins are very poor, so it's not like, you know, you're like, hey, I'm going to go out and just crush away because this is super fun because I've been lo losing money for the last four years. Oh, and <laughs> they took away shadow bank financing. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Um, so you've got that going on. Argentina, again, let's look at it. Massive inverse last year, right? Massive. But the farmer said, no, nah, that's cool. Market signals, market signals, don't need them. I'm going to carry 45% of the world's soybeans because that's fun. That's how much I hate our president. That's how much I hate our government. And yes, you have elections in 2015. 2015 is a long time off. And that Peronist socialism is very, very, very embedded. I mean, you know, and, and not to talk politics because you know, I, I lived in D.C. for five years and, you know, that's... That was, that was enough. Um, but it's fascinating to see, um, because you know, Canada and Australia have very successful social capitalist type economies, but the destruction of what socialism and the program has done to Argentina is just, it's so, so sad. As, as my counterparts, you know, muy triste. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very, you know, it's, 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 it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy to think Argentina in the 1980s was a powerhouse, really, an economic powerhouse. And now they're a blip on the radar screen. These are my summaries of that and how I kind of see the world um, playing out. Brazil's going to have a massive cro crop. We know that. It looks awfully good. I don't see many risks there. The Brazilian real is at 2.7. It's kind of had some of that contagion risk and hit you, you know, weaker Russian ruble, uh, that type of thing. So you have seen the producer step up, but you also see the Brazilian producer looking at what they're going to have to pay for inputs in a weaker real and that cost of inputs as they look at the safrina corn crop as well as next year. So I think we will see more on-farm storage from the Brazilians, so you're not going to see that push. I think the U.S. Uh, crush margins and the U.S. cash market, the U.S. cash market right now is the leading indicator and is what I watch every day to gauge, besides meal spreads and what meal is doing, it's the U.S. cash market that's driving this thing. Okay. Um, and, and so I think that continues. I don't think the Argentine farmer is an aggressive seller. Um, there's huge issues still there. You will have strikes and protests like you always do. Um, and I think this, again, to, to wrap up, you know, if I were to say you know, in the next 10 years or 20 years or what it might be, I do think it, there will be a cataclysmic event on the production side of things. I think the world will discover, just like we did, uh, with spring wheat in Minneapolis, of what it took to ration demand, because we do not know what that is in soybeans. You can say $18. Well, that's just a number, because we don't know. Does $1,000 a ton meal, is that what slows the dietary shift? Because again, what you've done is you've made a world exceptionally reliant and exceptionally vulnerable to a feed input and a seed that is 80% protein meal. Veg oil, you've got lots, you got lots of options. But soy meal, there, there isn't that alternative. Yes, you have canola meal, fine, but that's, you know, 45% protein or, you know, it's, whoa, wait, just kidding. 30% uh, protein or, you know, 25% protein. It, it's very, very low because canola is about oil. Palm is all about oil. Palm kernel meal, it's like 
eating popcorn and pretending you're on a diet. I, you know, it just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. There's no nutritional value per se. Um, so with that, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I guess if you have any questions, but thanks for your time this morning. Yes. No. <laughs> I totally believe them. Everything they say. So my point to you but again, I went to a land-grant university, so. so. So my point to you is this. You know, they do a lot of these things, and yet they're supposedly this long-term strategic thinking country, yada, yada. Comment on that. Because there's too many inconsistencies that just aren't seeming to add up, and at what point does that correct? Never. First of all, I don't think it ever corrects. I mean, it's a communist country. So you let me know when it doesn't become that. Um, but suffice it to say, I think they're more capitalist uh, than they, they are a communist. You know, listen, China's got a lot of money. You know? Um, they, they, instead of buying U.S. dollars or U.S. debt, they can buy, you know, U.S. corn or Ukraine corn or, you know, maybe that's a better investment. I think what China's doing right now is they're rethinking their whole investment, right? So they've tried to go, go into Brazil and, you know, own farms. And, well, that hasn't worked so well. And so let's, you know, let's build some uh, railroads. Well, that didn't work. You know, the infrastructure, not so well. So let's go buy Nidera and uh, Noble and integrate into world trade and what we can learn from them. I mean, they're, the, the Chinese aren't stupid. Um, and, and, you know, by and large, they're, they're quite good investors. So I don't think any of that changes. Um, they tried to hinky-dink with the, the bean market. They learned a very expensive lesson uh, with the red bean scare. Um, that was the only year that broke that left-right uptrend. That will probably never happen again. I think my biggest, if I was uh, Chinese and part of the party and, and over there, I think food safety, this thing is, is almost, I, I won't say out of control, but I think if I'm the, the government, I'm so concerned about food safety and this growing momentum and awareness of GMO and biotech and that sort of thing, I think that's a huge risk, a huge risk. And they're gonna have to be able to segment um, a lot of that because they're huge proponents, obviously, and investors in technology, um, stealers of technology perhaps as well, um, but you know. Uh, I, I think that's well documented. I don't think that's just you know something I pulled out of the air and made up. Um, but you know that's that's the reality of it. So I, I don't think it goes away. Uh, question here: yeah. uh, What would happen if, through genetics, that we could change our soybeans to be a higher composition in soybean meal? Oh, I well, you break the meal market. No, I'm just kidding. Um, don't do that. <laughs> just. <laughs> Why would you want $6 beans? Um, would that you know, listen, if that's possible, that'd be fantastic. I think you know, any time you can improve the efficiency and the feeding efficiency of an animal or deliver a higher protein to an animal, um, I think you eliminate waste. I think it's great for the environment. Yeah, you know, the list goes on. I mean, it's, it's, it's a domino type effect. I think the other thing um, on the India slide, which I find interesting, is that 90% of that poultry is a wet market. Okay. So, you know, they're fed in the background. I mean, that's not, they're not heavily processed yet, which is even scarier when you think about, you know, what it could be, rather than a wet market, that, that you go into a processed um, type market. So I, I, think, um, I think there's real value. And it is, and, and quite honestly, you know, we can say only a few things of true competitiveness of America um, with certain things, but certainly the, the protein levels in meal is one of your competitive advantages. There's, there's no question. Amino acids, amino acids you're talking, what if we change the amino acids value of well, It probably depends on what kind of animal you're, I mean, then you'd have to, I, that, that gets a little bit more tricky. I think I'm not an animal nu nutritionist, um, but you know, with, you know, you've got the multi-stomachs, you know, which is the, the beef, which is pretty small for meal because they're now in DDG world. Um, but swine and poultry would have different amino acid um, makeups, I would think. So maybe you're fragmenting a, a little bit, you know, too low and, and rather just focus on, on kind of just the, the broad-based um, animal performance. 